I'm so not humble. Good afternoon. We made it. How good has today been? Oh, it's been extraordinary, hasn't it? Do you know what's funny? I, I spend my life travelling to conferences. I fly in and I fly out. I never get to see other speakers. So today was amazing for me. I never get to see my peers. So I, I hope you've had a great time and, and hopefully you'll enjoy the next 20 or 25 minutes that we've got together. So what I want to talk to you about today is really what I spend my life studying, and that's kind of communications mastery. How do we become more persuasive, more influential? How do we, how do we motivate people as leaders? That's kind of what I spend my time studying. And I want to share with you, you know, what I think of what's often referred to as the soft skills. We've all heard that term before, the soft skills. I really hate that term because my, my observation is, is the technical skills. The hard skills make you good at your job, but what makes you good as a leader is your capacity to understand those soft skills, to communicate, to motivate, to understand what's going on in people's lives. And in fact, my belief is that we are all in the business of selling, all of us. If you're a leader, you're selling your vision, you're selling your ideas. And if you're a business person, you're obviously selling your, your products and your services. If you're a parent, you're selling bedtime and broccoli. And if you're in a relationship or you're trying to get into a relationship, you are very definitely in the business of sales. You might be investing in, in an online campaign. <laughs> you, you might be offering a gift with purchase promotion. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all about relationships. Some of you may have even used some false advertising using a bit of Photoshop. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making any accusations, but I'm sure we've all gone home with a prince or princess and woken up next to Shrek. I, I like the guy in the top right, clearly not a maths major. So we're all in the business of selling. The thing is, that's actually becoming more and more hard. It's becoming harder and harder to have influence, harder and harder to be persuasive. And part of the reason, as Julie just said, was we're overloaded with information. There is currently 295 exabytes of information that exists on planet Earth. 295 exabytes. That's the equivalent of taking every grain of sand on Earth and multiplying it by three. That's how much information just exists on Earth. And every year, we broadcast 1.9 zettabytes of that information at people through the internet, through emails, through television, through advertising. That's the equivalent of every human being on Earth reading 174 newspapers a day. We're not lacking for information. We're overwhelmed. Here's another frightening statistic. 50% of the Australian population was in the bottom half of the class. I always need to let that sit for a while because I'm never really sure which half of the class is in the room. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying this is geographically correct. What are the odds of Queensland being in the top half? <laughs> but, OK, let's forget about the mean. Let's forget about the mean. We'll talk about the median, the average person in the street, the average man in the street, as we often hear about. Here's the thing about the average man in the street. The average man in the street is, in fact, pretty average. Now, I'm sure you've all seen the standard deviation graph. Who's seen the bell curve before? Right, I work with universities all around the world, and this is how we standardise information all around the world. 65%, that's what it is. But it doesn't look like that before it's standardised. What re academic results look like before they're standardised is more like this. There's a few people up the top who are really smart. There's a whole pile of average around 50%. Some people who are below average, and then one person down the end who is technically a potato. The problem is when you combine all of those factors, when you combine the fact that we're overloaded with information, that we, we don't know what information is, is right and correct, and we're averaging at 65%, it's not that we make better decisions with all it, more information, we actually make worse decisions. In fact, we make no decisions. When we're overloaded with information, it actually causes us to procrastinate, causes us to doubt, causes us to make poor decisions. And again, Jules was just talking about this a little bit. You know, our capacity today to understand what information is worth listening to, to curate the information that supports our cause, and then to disseminate it to our supporters, that's what makes leadership critically important. But we don't spend a lot of time developing those communication skills. How many of you at school did a communications class or a presenting class? There's a handful, a handful of hands got up. How many of you have used trigonometry since leaving school? Again, not a, not a, not a thing that we, we shouldn't learn, but again, it didn't give us the life skills that were actually critical if we wanted to lead, if we wanted to be successful. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and also how it applies to leadership. Because our models of leadership have fundamentally shifted. This was the model of leadership I was promised when I left school in the late 1980s. Me at the top, obedient minions beneath me. 
and I was looking forward to it. <laughs> but that's not the model of leadership that showed up, is it? I don't think anyone's got that kind of model of leadership. I was recently doing some work with a military consortium, and uh, I do a lot of work with the military, and I was working with one of the generals who ran the war in Iraq, and he's kind of this old school guy. Like a, he reminded me of my grandfather. He was like a real man. He's the kind of guy they based those Chuck Norris facts on. You know, when he does push-ups, he doesn't lift himself up. He pushes the world down. He's that guy. <laughs> and I wanted to get a sense of him, you know, how did you lead such, such a, a, an interesting group of people up under such difficult circumstances? And he said to me, you know what, Dan? I led the most highly trained, the most well-resourced, the most disciplined workforce on the planet. It was my honour to serve with them. And then he eyeballed me. He said, Dan, what kind of people do you command? And I said, creative people. And he looked at me and he said, you poor bastard. Because he knows if his people, he ever gives his people an order, they will snap to attention and say, sir, yes, sir. If I was ever to give my people anything resembling an order, they would tell me to go and do something to myself that might be a little bit more enjoyable if another participant was involved. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to you? Here's the thing, that's the leadership we're called to today. It's no longer about authority. It's no longer about positional authority. It's about how do we create cultures of the willing, cultures of the voluntary, cultures of the enthusiastic. In other words, how do we amplify our influence in such a way that people show up wanting to deliver their best work? That's what leadership calls for today. Let's have a little bit of a chat about that because that's, that's what I think is really important. Now, I spend most of my time, most of my work, making smart people, people smart. Smart people, people smart. Because one of the problems with really, really smart people is we think being right's enough. We fall in love with our rightness. And we think, but I'm right. Why aren't people listening? Here's the thing. Being right is important, but it's not enough. We've got to get over this idea that we shouldn't have to sell if we're right. We, we shouldn't have to be persuasive if we've got the facts. That's just not the way the world works. We're all in the business of engagement and selling and persuasion and influence. How do we make sure that we get the people on board that we need on board? How do we make sure that the facts that matter most to us are the ones that get out there? So let's talk about that. First thing I want to say is know what motivates them and what motivates you. Know what motivates them and what motivates you. Now, the reason this matters is all engagement starts with them, not you. Start with who? Start with the people you're talking to. The, the amount that you understand them determines how engaged they are with you. The sale is always in the prospect, not the product. Engagement is always on the other side of the table. And yet we spend most of our time talking about ourselves. So let me tell you about my product, Dan. Let me tell you about my features and benefits. As opposed to going, no, why don't you tell me about you and then I'll see if I can meet your needs, if I can solve your problems. I do a lot of work working with people on understanding how different personalities drive people's decision making. Now, who here has done something like Myers-Briggs or, or DISC? Now, I mean, they're all quite good systems. I, I actually don't mind them at all. The problem, I have two problems really with them. The first is we treat them as a fait accompli. We treat them as, this is who you are and this is who you will always be and you can never be anything else. People will say things like, oh, Dan, you're such an INTJ. Or people will say, Dan, you're a complete D. Sometimes even when we're not talking about DISC. <laughs> right? And I think that's problematic. I don't like to think that way. I like to think of default thinking frames. In other words, through nature and nurture, we have all assembled a group of filters that help us make meaning of our worlds. And we tend to lean on one thing or another more than, others, more than others in terms of making that meet, meaning. The other thing is, is they're quite cumbersome. Let's say I'm having a sales conversation with you or I'm having a meeting with you as a member of my staff. It's pretty difficult for me to say, listen, I'm about to give you a sales pitch, but if you wouldn't mind doing this personality test and then feeding the results into me, then maybe we can sit and have a conversation. It's pretty cumbersome, isn't it? So I like to teach people a way of doing speed archetypes. In other words, I help people identify the, the visual, the verbal, and the behavioural cues, the hashtags that we drop into our language that reveal what's the filter that we use most dominantly. In other words, you can tune your ear to understand a way a human being is communicating with you the same way you can learn to understand a piece of music. I was raised in a very musical family. My mum won the child pro uh, won the, uh, was a child prodigy who won the nationalist effort when she was 12 years of age. And it was all about tuning our ear. But we can tune our ear to the way people talk to us. 
And there's, there's really four principal filters that people use. People use either imagination to solve a problem, or they use emotion or relationships to solve a problem. Who can I ask about this? They might use information. In other words, they're, they're knowledge-based in their solutions, or they might be action-based. They tend to be quite action-oriented. And I'll solve things as I go. I like to call these people imagineers, empaths, logicians, and pragmatists. Now, these four filters show up everywhere. And again, you're not one or the other. You just have a, a kind of a leaning or, or you tend to bias towards one way of solving a problem versus another. But this shows up in our, in our literature. This shows up in, in the books that we read. This shows up in popular culture. You know, these filters inform what our cultures look like. They determine what our brands stand for. We filter the world through the way that we make meaning. I mean, just out of interest, how many people here uh, think that they probably have a bias towards action? They reckon they might be a bit of a pragmatist. Who thinks they're a bit of a pragmatist? Yeah, there's a, there's a few of them in the room. I mean, it's always good at the close of a conference, just before we go to drinks, to find out where the Samanthas are sitting in the room. <laughs> but again, understanding what's driving people is incredibly important. And again, we use different kinds of language. We use different kinds of humour. We speak in a different way. Imagineers tend to say, what if? Empaths tend to say, who with? Logicians say, what not? And pragmatists say, what now? And they use different kinds of, of language, different kinds of behaviours, and you can learn to understand what's driving people. You can even hear it when they tell a joke. Like, imagineers tend to be self-deprecating. They say, I'm not okay, you're okay. Empaths say, I'm not okay, you're okay, but maybe we can be okay together. Logicians say, I'm okay, you're not okay. And pragmatists say, I'm not okay, you're not okay, but screw it, that's okay. You can hear it in the way they tell a joke. Like, again, an imagineer, they're very self-deprecating. They'll say something like, uh, I'm not very good in bed, but luckily not a lot of women want to sleep with me, so it hasn't been much of a problem. <laughs> I'm not okay, you're okay. Versus a logician, I'm okay, you're not okay. I had a girlfriend once who said to me, you know, Dan, I always fake it when I'm with you, so I handed her a script and said, well, as long as you're pretending, here's how I'd like it to go. Our language reveals who we are. Our behaviour reveals who we are. But we've never taken the time to learn how to speak that language, how to understand what's going on with people. If we want to be influential, we need to be interested. We need to understand what's going on in people's minds if we want to engage them. Because the, those filters are based on their values. And the more we understand their values and the more we're able to frame our value in terms of those values, the more they buy in and the more willing they are to buy from us. So the first thing is know what motivates them and what motivates you. Second thing I want to say is know what you stand for. What's the stand you take? And I don't care whether you call this personal brand or your thought leadership or your positioning in the marketplace. It's all the same thing. It's based on what are you prepared to stand for. Now, why does this matter so much? It matters because according to Nielsen Research, over 90% of people rely on friend recommendations before making any major decision. They don't just ask for, they don't just consider, they rely on friend recommendations. So you better have a pretty powerful positioning. You better own a space in people's minds. But what's amplifying this even further is people now treat Google like God. Think about how often you do a Google search. How often do you check beyond the first five results just to make sure that the rigour in the search results is, 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 is adequate? Most people never look. And in fact, our capacity to, to live off our reputation is incredibly important. Your reputation walks in the room before you do. In fact, there are entire businesses built on the idea of reputation. TripAdvisor is the most powerful organisation in the travel industry at the moment. They make zero products. All they do is curate other people's opinions. They share and build and sometimes knock down reputations. What is it that you stand for? Because that's what your reputation is built on. In fact, it's actually built on more than just what you stand for. I believe it's built on what you stand for, who you stand with, what you stand against, and how you stand up. What's the change you seek? Who do you partner with in seeking that change? What's the injustice you seek to correct? And what's your behaviour look like as a result of that? Your brand is your reputation. It's not what you say about you, it's what other people say about you when you're not in the room. 
Do you know what they're saying? Again, if you're not giving them the the stuff to say, they're saying whatever they want. You know, if you have a think about the great leaders that we've seen through history, you know, Jules talked about this a moment ago, the great leaders have the capacity to stand for something and create a sense of certainty. You know, Winston Churchill didn't say, well, we should fight them on the beaches. But look, if they make it past the sand, there is very little we can do at that point. (laughs) He said, we shall never surrender. Never, 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 never. Not a lot of wiggle room in that. Not a lot of British soldiers going, hang on, is that three or four before we surrender? Right, he created a sense of certainty. You know, Anita Roddick, when she, she created the body shop, no animal testing. She wanted to create a beauty company that wasn't ugly on the inside. Fundamentally changed the way the industry worked and the way consumers interacted with that industry. When we launched Aussie Home Loans into the marketplace some almost 20 years ago now, we picked a fight with the bullies in the schoolyard. Does anyone remember what interest rates were like back in the early 1990s? Yeah? yeah? I mean, at the, our loans increased year on year by almost 20%. And again, what we did was, at the time, you probably remember, there was a really famous advertising campaign for the Commonwealth Bank called Which Bank? So the first ad we ran for Aussie Home Loans was this. Which bank has been ripping you off for years? What a lot of people don't know is, within the first two weeks of the launch campaign, all of the big four banks equaled Aussie's rate, all of them. In other words, our competitive advantage lasted less than a fortnight. There was no price advantage. We weren't selling a rate, though. What we were selling was the ability to give the banks one of those. (laughs) The reputation was as much built on what he stood against as what he stood for. And again, how do you stand up? How do you provide evidence for what you claim? You know, FedEx has, has for a long time said, we are absolutely positively overnight. That's what they stood for. Absolutely positively overnight. But it wasn't just an advertising line. They backed it up. A- ahead of all other courier companies, they serviced their trucks and their planes twice as often. So they made sure their trucks and planes wouldn't break down. They walked their talk. We need to start thinking of, of our brand as a, as a system of behaviours rather than as a logo or a livery or a catchphrase. A brand is what we do and how we re- represent ourselves to the world, what we stand for, who we stand with, what we stand against and how we stand up. Last thing I want to say to you is know what you're really selling. Who here doesn't like the word selling? There's a few of you. Good, I'm going to keep using it. I'm going to keep using it until you start to like it. Because I work with really smart people, as I said. I work with climate scientists. And they say, we shouldn't have to sell, Dan. We've got all the science. And I go, how's that working for you? We shouldn't have to sell. I've got a degree. Problem is, smart people are so far up their own asses (laughs) that they're too proud to sell. Don't be too proud to sell. Understand what drives people. And again, sales is just about aligning value with values. And caring enough to make sure your message is the one that gets across. And it's about understanding what's the business that you're really in. What's the value you create? We tend to think of our business as being, well, it's my job description or it's my role or it's my product or my service. That's not your business. The business you create, your business you have is the value you create. I was working with some, uh, some salespeople recently for a big pharmaceutical company. They, they, they sell to doctors. And I said to them, can anyone here tell us what your customers are actually in the business of? What do your customers sell? Their customers are doctors. Actually, I'll ask you guys. What do you think doctors sell? Just yell it out. Health? Hope? Feel better? Advice? Insurance? Someone said it. Drugs? I mean, all the kind of answers they gave me. Here's the thing. Doctors are professional services. Doctors sell time. If I go and see my Dr. Shane, he says, Dan, you're a diabetic with high blood pressure. He writes me a prescription. I walk out the front door, massive stroke, drop dead. I didn't get health. I didn't get well-being. Shane got paid. I didn't make it to the pharmacy to get my drug. Shane got selfish prick. Here's why that matters. Every single one of those pharmaceutical salespeople was on the phone every day was the one thing they asked doctors to give them for free. We infringe on our customers' values all the time. We infringe on our people's values all the time because we don't understand them well enough. I was working with some optometrists recently. I said, can anyone here tell me what business you're in? I said, oh, we're all eye doctors, Dan. We're all in medical services. I said, oh, that's interesting. 
Where's the money? Where do you make the margin? Do you make the money in the back room going, blurry, less blurry, <laughs> blurry, less blurry. Five years at university to do that, blurry, <laughs> less blurry. And they'll say, well, well, no, the consults cover the cost, but we actually make all of our real money selling frames. I said, well, that's interesting. So you're not in medical services, you're all in retail fashion. And they all said, five years at university, and this guy tells me I work at Katie's. <laughs> but I said, how have you decorated your store? Is your store decorated like a fashion boutique that's inviting and I want to go in, spend some time browsing, trying stuff on? Or is it decorated like a medical clinic that's intimidating and I don't want to go inside unless I have to? How have you arranged your frames in store? Are they arranged by face shape so I know it's going to make me look good? Or by season so I know it's going to make me look fashionable? Or are they arranged generically by brand? And where do you spend your training budget? Do you spend your training budget on yourself so you can do the blurry, less blurry thing more efficiently? Or do you spend it on the 19-year-old who's sitting up front updating her Facebook status when she's your sales department and the source of all your profit? And they and all of us spend time, money and focus on the wrong things. Because we don't understand the business that we're really in. Because the business that we're really in is value. Here's a way to think about it. When I talk to sales teams, when I'm working with groups in, or, or pitch teams in the B2B space, I get them to go through the levels of the sale to move from the literal sale, what you're, just, what you're literally selling, to the emotional benefit that that's providing and then have an understanding of the psychological uh, decision that makes the basis of all, all sales decisions. Now, you may never mention the psychological level, but you need to understand it. You need to understand what's really driving people. If you're going to create engagement, we, uh, we do a lot of work with, uh, with all kinds of businesses. Most of our work is with the big end of town, the big corporates, but we also do a lot of work um, with, uh, with small businesses as well. And we're working with a couple of small business businesses recently. Uh, one was a, a, uh, an arborist, a, a tree lopper in Melbourne. And, uh, and we came to us and, and we said, uh, what, what do you think you really sell, Nick? What, what, what are you selling? And his, his business was called Nick's Tree Lopping or something like that. And he said, uh, oh, well, I make people feel good about cutting down trees. And we said, we're probably not going to put that on the website, Nick. <laughs> what do you mean, mate? And he said, well, here's the thing. When a tree lopper cuts down a tree, they, they chip it and it goes towards, you know, becomes mulch. He said, I don't do that. I'm an environmentalist. If the tree is any bigger than this in diameter, I keep the timber and I turn it into furniture. Cool, right? Nowhere on his website. It's nothing but photos of Nick holding a chainsaw. It's like a Tinder profile, <laughs> right? And we go, Nick, the business is cutting down trees. The business is far more fundamental. What he's literally selling is tree removal. The emotional benefit is that people feel okay about it. But the psychological sell is he's not in tree removal, he's in guilt removal. Now, he's never going to say that to people. But understanding that's what's driving the purchase decision is incredibly important. We said, first thing we do is we're going to change the name of your business. It's no longer called Nick's Tree Lopping. It's called treeincarnation.com. What will your tree come back as? He's the most expensive tree lopper in Melbourne. He's got a 100% pitch rate. He's done so well, he took six months off the business this year to travel the world. Again, the business is exactly the same. He just understands what he's selling now. Understanding what they want to buy. The thing is, people, who here likes buying stuff and shopping? Right. Who here likes being sold to? There's a bit of a disconnect, right? Again, sell them what they want to buy. We were doing some work with a, with a business up in Brisbane called Lawn Block. And basically, has anyone here ever laid a lawn before? Typically, you, you know what it's like. When you lay a lawn, you get those big, heavy rolls of lawn and, they, and you have to be quite physical and, and, and quite strong to actually unroll the, the sod and, and put it in the right place. They don't do that. They make lawn blocks the size of carpet squares so anyone can, can lay a lawn using lawn blocks. And they said, oh, we want to go out and tell people how easy it is to lay a lawn using lawn block. And we said, great, why don't we use a, a classic torture test? What we'll do is we'll show a little old lady, some like Betty White laying a lawn with lawn block just to show how anyone could do it. And so we came up with this idea. If you see a tradie in my front yard, he's not laying the lawn. <laughs> and I'll be honest, when we came up with that idea, we had the afternoon off. <laughs> but then we thought, 
No, let's make sure that we're not just amusing ourselves. Let's make sure this is actually going to sell. Let's make sure this is actually what they're looking to buy. So we sat down and we had a look at some of the purchasing data from the big box hardware stores, people like Bunnings, people, people like, like um, Masters. And we had a look at the purchasing data and what we found was the average lawn purchase from big box hardware stores was two metres by two metres, four metres squared. That is smaller than the average courtyard garden in a Sydney townhouse. And we thought, well, that's weird. That's not enough to lay a whole lawn. What we realised was people weren't going to hardware stores because they needed to lay a whole lawn. They were going to hardware stores because they had one of these. Or they had one of these. Or they have one of these. And they want to get their bond back. And in fact, what we realised was people weren't buying lawn. What they were buying was a lawn repair kit. So that's how we changed, we changed the marketing. We changed the way they sold it. We said, actually, don't, don't buy lawn block to, to lay a whole lawn. Buy it as a lawn repair kit. This was two Christmases ago. And in the lead up to Christmas, we decided to run ads that were a little bit more like this. December 24, December 25. Because we all know the real meaning of Christmas is judging family. In other words, the more you can understand beneath the literal thing that you sell, beneath the emotional benefit, the psychological driver that's sitting behind what people do, in other words, the more willing you are to understand those you wish to be engaged, those you wish to persuade, those you wish to have influence with, the more powerful your influence gets to be. Here's the thing. Too many good ideas die on the vine, not because they're bad ideas, but for a lack of influence. Ideas without influence are impotent, but ideas with influence have impact. Don't let your ideas die in the vine. Make sure people are paying attention. Thank you very much.